Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Cormac Collier. I'm the executive director of the Nantucket Land Council. This is, uh, I'm proud to say, our first annual State of the Harbor Forum to be held at the Great Harbor Yacht Club. Um, first, I want to just uh, say a few thank yous to a number of individuals for helping this um, come to fruition. First and foremost, uh, the Great Harbor Yacht Club, thank you very much. Great Harbor Yacht Club for uh, hosting us. Can you hear me now? Better? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to Steve and the rest of the board uh, of the Yacht Club. Also, um, our sponsors and underwriters, uh, which are listed on the brochure and pamphlet uh, that each of you should have had uh, on your seat. In particular, our lead sponsor, the Nantucket Shellfish Association. Many thanks to them. And uh, you'll also uh, sort of find a theme throughout some of these presentations that much of this work is uh, funded by either foundations or nonprofits or um, different grant programs. And I do want to uh, make a, a, a note of thanks to the Great Harbor Yacht Club for funding a lot of these programs and a lot of this research, and then also to the Nantucket Shellfish Association as well. So the impetus of why we're here today, um, we've done these types of presentations and talks in the past, but we've never really had a collective group of individuals giving a comprehensive, serve, a comprehensive presentation of the main issues surrounding the harbor. And I thought it was important, and my colleagues thought it was important to present this information to the public so that really we get a good snapshot a comprehensive snapshot of what the issues are, what the environmental uh, health is of the harbor, and then also, what's very important, is what's being done about it. Because we have a tendency on Nantucket, as you all know, to talk about the problems, the problems, the problems, and sometimes we don't talk enough about the strategies and solutions um, that we should be undergoing. So a little bit about the Land Council, um, which I see many familiar faces, so I know uh, much of you, many of you do know who we are, but we're an environmental organization. We were created in 1974, somewhat as an offshoot of the Nanteca Conservation Found Foundation. Primarily, our main mission at that time was to be an advocate, to essentially be the environmental watchdog for the island, to do the nitty gritty work that um, the main land conservation group couldn't do at the time. We've evolved into uh, a number of different programs. We still do um, advocacy, as you know. We're at town meeting, we're at the Board of Selectmen, we're at the Planning Board, Board of Health, any number of agency that either deals with regulatory matters or policy matters as it relates to the health, environmental health of our island and our waters, the Land Council is there. Secondly, uh, we have moved into a land conservation role starting in the 80s. We do land conservation through conservation restrictions. In other states, they're called conservation easements. We protect uh, over 1,400 acres through conservation restrictions on Nantucket, Tuckernuck, and Muskegon. And then finally, some of the work that we've been doing and really doing more recently and focusing on as the island evolves into uh, more of a situation where a lot of the land is conserved and a lot of the land is actually already developed. There's certainly a remaining amount of 15 to 10% of the land that's uh, potentially could be developed or put into conservation. But as that land, you know, that available land decreases, our mission somewhat is shifting to really focusing on land use and the impacts of development, impacts of other issues with a population, increasing population on the environment. So with that uh, work that we do, we do a lot of research work. Um, our main focus is on a lot on the freshwater uh, freshwater bodies partnering with the town and with the Nantucket Pond Coalition. But we also do a lot of education as well, such as um, our educational outreach on the environmental issues and what we're doing here today. And with that, I want to encourage everybody to become a member if you're not a member already. <laughs> we have plenty of information about the Land Council out in the, um, in the lobby there. I really encourage you to take a look at it and, um, and help us support our work. So with that, I do want to get into um, today's um, forum. We have a number of speakers um, as presented in our uh, pamphlet, and then uh, just some logistics. It'll be about 15 minutes per speaker, and then we'll have about five minutes for question and answers. Um, and again, we've tried to cover every, um, at least, main priority 
issues surrounding the harbor, but by no means is, are these the only issues involved. We want to take this forum and uh, analyze what works, what didn't, where were the data gaps, um, which we're always doing as a sort of a, a research community and advocacy community, and see where we can explore in the future. So to start off with, I'd like to introduce Caitlin Shaw. She is the water quality specialist with the town of Nantucket. Caitlin came to us recently in 2015. Caitlin holds a master's in coastal system sciences from the U University of Massachusetts, the School for Marine Science and Technology. Caitlin. and thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's really exciting to have this be the first annual uh, presentation of all of these, uh, all the information about uh, Nantucket Harbor. Um, I think it's a really uh, great idea and I look forward to uh, participating in these in the future as well. So I just want to give you a little bit of background and then I'm going to talk to you about the actual state of the harbor at where we're at right now. So to give you a little bit of background, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the nitrogen cycle. Typically in uh, marine, uh, marine systems, nitrogen, in, nitrogen is the limiting nutrient. That means that without nitrogen, uh, plants can't grow. So we talk a lot about nitrogen, although other micronutrients and phosphorus are also important as well. So, uh, this uh, diagram here is just showing that nitrogen uh, can come from the atmosphere. Uh, it also is available in plant matter, uh, in animal uh, proteins, and then in decaying material and waste. Um, this is a kind of typical situation in a natural environment. Um, and typically, nitrogen will either come from uh, Lightning can uh, bring atmosphere from an unusable form to a usable form, and also bacteria can fix nitrogen and take it from an unusable form into a more usable form. So in this type of scenario, we would have a balanced ecosystem in terms of estuarine health. This is a diagram of an estuary, and this is showing a natural environment. We have uh, plants and animals and uh, low development. Um, you might have agriculture and uh, you can see that there's also um, a buffer here. So nutrients will come into the system uh, from the land in a estuarine system that's uh, the connection between the land and the ocean and it usually is semi-enclosed. So nutrients will come in and then this vegetation here uh, will uptake nitrogen and phosphorus, those essential nutrients. This will lead to less nutrients coming into the system um, because of that uptake by plants. So in this balanced ecosystem, we have ample eelgrass and a diverse assemblage of other uh, plant species um, seaweeds, and we also have uh, algae operating in a balanced way with the ecosystem. And this habitat is supportive of uh, shellfish and fish. And there's ample oxygen for those fish and shellfish to survive. Uh, this type of system would uh, look like this. It would be uh, clear water, a sandy soils, and, um, and bright green eelgrass, and lots of uh, diversity in fish and shellfish. Okay, so flash forward, that was kind of a basic uh, balanced system uh, to the early 1900s when uh, a couple of researchers came up with a process by which they could take atmospheric nitrogen, unusable nitrogen, and turn it into usable nitrogen uh, by a process called the Haber-Bosch process. And this started in the early 1900s, as you see here, 
Um, the red curve is showing the amount of nitrogen, usable nitrogen produced um, by that method. And then the blue line here, here, <laughs> is showing um, the amount of human population in millions. So you can see, um, obviously this method was very important for agriculture. It made it so that we could uh, produce a lot of uh, crops in a smaller amount of space than previously, and it made it um, much easier for the population to grow very quickly. Um, on the right here, you'll see a, a figure of the same, um, well, right around the time when it started, that's where this uh, figure begins in the 1900s. And we're looking at hypoxic events. So hypoxia is just a scientific word for low oxygen. And typically when there's low oxygen, you don't have as much diversity of uh, animal species. So this figure is just showing the number of hypoxic or low oxygen events that have occurred since the start of this process of turning unusable nitrogen into usable nitrogen in the, in the form of fertilizers, primarily. So flash forward to today, and we can talk about the types of uh, nitrogen or nutrient sources that we're faced with in our coastal regions. So some uh, main sources are those same fertilizers, turf fertilizer, lawn fertilizers, those are uh, created by that process that I was just talking about. Atmospheric deposition, either in rain or through lightning or even dry deposition from the atmosphere. And the burning of fossil fuels actually uh, progresses that deposition as well. Um, natural inputs, which would have occurred before that process, uh, farm animals, wastewater, um, stormwater, and then if you have any sort of um, disposal areas, that would also contribute because you have plant and animal matter which contain nitrogen and those are decaying. Okay, so we're flashing forward to today and this is the same diagram but we see that there's an increase in population near the coast. As we know, many, many people live near the coast much more than inland across the world. Um, and we've lost some of that natural vegetation that occurred at that um, interface between the land and the um, marine system. So we have uh, the same um, we probably have, we definitely have more uh, nutrient inputs than we did back before this process was developed. And we also have uh, nutrient, we also have inputs that are coming into the system that are not um, being taken up by, by that vegetation because the, um, the Conservation Commission, which protects those areas, wasn't always um, in place, and people were allowed to build very close to the, um, the interface between the land and the sea, and building there is actually limiting the ability for plants to take up those nutrients naturally. They still do take up nitrogen and phosphorus, but probably in much less quantities than if we had um, ample vegetation in that area. So in this uh, circumstance, we have uh, more algae growth because the system is not in balance. So there would be, this is representative of algae, and more algae growth will cause the light to decrease, and we might have the eelgrass moving to shallower regions and opportunistic species, which can take advantage of low light and high nutrient conditions, such as seaweed, and some nuisance species existing in the deeper areas. There's still fish and shellfish, yet when these algae decompose and die, they'll fall to the bottom, and that actually consumes oxygen, which leads to um, either loss in terms of death or 
fish can leave the area, if they can move, then they might leave to find a better habitat, more suitable for them with higher oxygen levels. So this system is imbalanced. The amount of nutrients coming into this system are not um, in balance with the amount of uptake that the system can handle. A system that's imbalanced might look like this. We might not have eelgrass present any longer. There might be low water clarity conditions and there might be a lot of um, seaweed species which are opportunistic rather than um, some more long-lived species like eelgrass. So this isn't a Nantucket problem. This is uh, something that's occurring throughout the world. Um, the, red, uh, the red dots here are representing low oxygen conditions and the yellow is representing eutrophic or uh, in enhanced nutrient conditions. And then the green is showing systems that are in recovery and we'll come back to that. So why do we care? I think that most of you know why we care. Increased algae blooms can uh, produce toxins which can affect our ability to harvest shellfish, our ability to swim in certain systems. Um, just last year, there was uh, an algae bloom in the harbor that limited our ability to take shellfish for a little while. It was called pseudonychia, and it can produce a toxin. So this is something that is happening here. And also, it doesn't look very nice. This is an, uh, a seaweed uh, bloom. So what's being done about it? Well, the Clean Water Act was developed, and they developed water quality standards, and then they put systems on the 303D list of impaired water bodies, and that list basically culminated in what they call total maximum daily loads, which are amounts of nutrients that systems can handle based on what used to live in those systems. Um, and they're basically threshold goals for us to follow so that our systems can either be restored or stay in the area that they need to stay in terms of health. So we're actually in the nutrient reduction strategy. Nantucket Harbor has um, a goal set for its nutrients, the amount that it can handle, and we're in the process, as um, my colleagues will talk about, um, we're in the process of reducing those nutrients. So what are some of the goals? Well, we don't want to have algae blooms. Um, we don't want to have blooms that cause toxins or levels that are affecting our shellfish. Um, we want high oxygen. We want the oxygen to stay above five and six. Our waters are considered um, high quality waters, SA is the designation, and that means that they should have uh, dissolved oxygen levels above five. So the Massachusetts Estuaries Project was the project that completed our uh, threshold goals in terms of nutrients. And the, this is a kind of confusing figure or uh, map, but I, all I wanna show you is that this dark green color, that's us, Nantucket, and that, that means that we're in the process of developing those nutrient reduction strategies Whereas most of the Cape is actually still in the process of either developing those goals, and that means that we're actually like ahead in terms of where we're at in Nantucket. So we have a water quality sampling program, which um, I uh, participate, or which our de department uh, runs. Um, these are the the locations where we take water quality samples throughout the. Um, the growing season uh, from June to September. And we do routine testing. We also sample algae uh, at the Brant Point Dock weekly to look for those toxin forming species and make sure that we let the Department of Marine Fisheries know if we see high levels of those species. We also do education and outreach in the schools and talk to children about what water quality means to us and why it's important to protect water quality. So in terms of our health um, in Nantucket Harbor, this figure is just showing the trends. So it's showing from our five-year average until present what um, 
what uh, is actually going on in terms of our goals. So the green is showing that we are achieving our goals. So in the lower harbor, we are uh, achieving those nutrient threshold goals. In the upper harbor, in Pulpus Harbor, we haven't met those goals yet. And uh, an arrow that's pointing up means that although we haven't, may have not reached those goals, it's actually on the upswing, it is improving. If the arrow is pointing down, such as in the um, West Pulpus Harbor or in the, uh, the area of um, this area of the harbor, then it's an actually worsening. So we might be achieving our goals, but our threshold, our um, trend from uh, our five-year average to 2016 is actually declining. So we've put in um, funding and actually received funding from the Great Harbor Yacht Club and Nantucket Land Council Marine Resources Grant Program to uh, deploy SONs, which are actually remotely deployed items that are going to tell us about the dissolved oxygen every hour, and they'll let us know things that we can't know from just taking samples because we're not able to be there at that critical time sometimes. So these actually measure dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, pH, and chlorophyll, which is a proxy for how much algae is in the water. And then we also um, receive funding for side scan sonar, which is going to enable us to continue to map our eelgrass resources. And then <laughs> this little thing here is called the spectrophotometer, and it will help us to internally test for nutrients um, so that we can test source water, groundwater, and inputs, and then enable us to understand where might need additional testing or additional research. <laughs> so um, I'd like to answer any questions that you might have. I know this is uh, just a brief overview, but we do regularly um, conduct other presentations that are a little bit more detailed, have a little bit more specifics involved. And this is my uh, favorite Dr. Seuss quote, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. And thank you. Questions? Questions for Caitlin, Val? Sure, Val just asked where base scallops would fit on the spectrum of uh, oxygen requirements. Um, I did see, I did have another um, figure that did include base scallops and it had uh, them at two milligrams per liter, but I'm sure that uh, current research might have them at different levels. Um, and you also need to consider not just the value that they're able to um, handle, but the amount of time that they actually are in that uh, condition as well. Um, well, I think, repeat the, repeat the. oh sure, um, the question was that there were uh, modeling results or uh, models that showed that the increase in the jetty height would improve flushing in the harbor um, and how long it would take to determine whether that was um, actually improving. So the study that um, this gentleman is referring to said that in increasing the jetty height, uh, extending the sewers, which uh, Roberto will talk about, and, um, and controlling our fertilizer inputs would all bring us to our goal. So I think that it, it will, that is probably one of the fastest um, things that would show improvement, whereas some of the other uh, uh, management uh, techniques would take a little bit more time. But I would expect that if that's uh, producing an improvement, that we would be able to see that um, quite quickly, so we might be able to see it in this year or next year, if, if that is the case. And we do have a couple of fishermen that have mentioned, and I've been out in that area, and it does, we haven't measured it, but it does appear um, from speaking to those, um, some people that spend a lot of time in the harbor that it has, in fact, increased.
We're going to uh, just move on to the next speaker. We'll have a, another right at the end of the, the, everything for all the questions that didn't get answered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And just also, um, just to clarify that last remark too, um, the modeling and expectations for improved water quality uh, with the jetties, with the fertilizer, and with the sewers, that was just for the Monomoy sub-basin. It wasn't to extend the middle of the channel and going all the way up to the head of the harbor. The jetties really, the effectiveness in terms of improving the circulation was just that first part of the harbor. Okay, next up we have, um, and I, I do want to make a mention, we always want to um, give speakers half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. We do these individual talks and really everybody could talk on for about an hour, hour and 15, hour and a half. I apologize if some of this stuff is very condensed, but that's just the way um, we are presenting it here. And again, this is a learning experience to grow on, to, uh, to build on, to add any other additional information we have through communication with you, the public, and with everybody else that's involved. Just a, another little note is that there are numerous um, people either that are elected officials, used to be elected officials, serve on current boards, either nonprofits or departments, or actually work for nonprofits in this room right now. And that's why also I get very excited about these types of gatherings because there's a great amount of energy in terms of uh, interest and um, uh, 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 hopes for the restoration of the harbor. So with that, I'd like to introduce Tara Riley. Tara is our shellfish biologist at the town of Nantucket. These are all my good friends, but I don't know where they went to school, so I have to get rid <laughs> from here. Um, Tara went to Urban, uh, Auburn University and received her master's in fisheries and aquaculture. She came to the island in about 2009, and the uh, breadth and, uh, 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 of the work that she's done with the propagation facility is quite amazing. She'll give you a little snapshot of what she's doing down there, along with the health of the shellfish and the eelgrass in the harbor, but I encourage you. If there's one thing you take away and you want to do after this, go see the lab. It's an amazing, amazing uh, facility. Thanks. Tar? Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, as Cormac said, my name is Tara Riley. I'm the town shellfish biologist. I've been here since 2009, and for those of you who do not know where the shellfish hatchery is, it's right at the end of Brant Point. Um, oh, there it is. Uh, it's one of. It used to be one of the Coast Guard buildings, and it was moved to Brant Point in the early 1900s. The Coast Guard occupied it and used it for working on their boats. And then the town was able to acquire it. And it served as a hub for harbor research over um, many years. And when I came in 2009, I kind of saw it as a, bank, a blank slate and a really great opportunity to kind of reinvigorate um, the shellfish by uh, starting a hatchery. And so it really has an ideal location. It's right at the entrance to the harbor. Um, it's very unique for a municipality to have its own hatchery to serve um, public fisheries. And um, we also operate under a town shellfish management plan that was developed in 2012, which is also very unique to um, a community. There's very few in the United States that have been developed. So we're very lucky to have that as a guide um, for our shellfish program. So we've been working with base gobs for quite some time. That's kind of um, where the emphasis is uh, due to the heritage and the culture of base gobs on the island. Uh, we've also kind of migrated into oyster restoration and quahog enhancement as well. It's important to acknowledge the word enhancement. Um, what we do is we try to help the wild stocks that already exist in Nantucket Harbor. We're not a replacement program, so we really just want um, the wild stocks to thrive and be sustainable and give them a helping hand when possible. So in 2015 and 2016, we were able to receive some funding and completely gut um, the boathouse is what we informally call the building. So 
We visited lots of hatcheries along the East Coast. We did a lot of research. We talked to a lot of people in the hatchery business and we consulted them and came up with a design plan that was appropriate for Nantucket. Um, it's a historical building, so we are limited to the footprint that we had. And so we had to be really creative on how we could figure out ways to produce more shellfish given the footprint that we, that we had. So this is the inside of the hatchery now, as you can see it today. Um, we opened it up and we, all of our designs were to preserve floor space so that we could grow the maximum amount of shellfish. Um, so a lot of our tanks are tall and narrow um, and we made a lot of uh, upgrades to like three-phase power and we upgraded our pumps um, to make everything more efficient. Uh, it also uh, is now a um, climate controlled facility which changed it from a seasonal facility to year-round. So one of the important parts of running a shellfish hatchery is um, culturing all the algae that it takes to feed the shellfish. Um, this is a pretty intensive production um, part of the process. And so uh, it takes a lot of algae to feed shellfish. So since we have such a small building, most hatcheries operate their algae systems in greenhouses. And so we knew that since the beach was owned by the Coast Guard, and it's a historical building, there was no way we would probably be allowed to have a greenhouse on the dock. Um, plus, it's really exposed. So we had to think of a creative way to grow more algae in, um, in the space that we had. So we applied for some grants with the Nantucket Shellfish Association to purchase some LED lights. Uh, we did a lot of research on, um, on phytoplankton, out, which is algae, um, and how it grows under, um, it grows more efficiently using red and blue wavelengths of light. So our new LEDs have adjustable spectrums of red and blue wavelengths of light. So that purple glow that you see coming from Brant Point is our efficient algae system. It's not, it's not a disco. <laughs> so one of the rooms that's really important in the, in the hatchery is called the broodstock room. So we bring in adult um, shellfish, whether it's cohogs, uh, scallops or oysters and we mimic the conditions of spring or summer. So normally this time of year shellfish are spawning and reproducing um, but if we bring them in in winter time and we have a set uh, light cycle, um, 16 hours of light and 8 hours of dark and we pump algae into their tanks and we keep the climate at 68 degrees, that allows their gonads or their eggs and sperm to mature so that we're able to spawn them um, on demand basically any time of the year as long as we allow the proper amount of time for development. So in the old hatchery we only had three <coughs> tanks to do this and now we have 12 tanks so um, we've been really able to crank out uh, some shellfish and not really have a break in production, which has been really nice. So once the shellfish are mature, we put them on our spawn tables. The spawn tables are painted black. They're just shallow, um, big shallow trays. And remember, they've been held at 68 degrees for six to eight weeks. Um, we just increase their temperature uh, from, you know, seven or 10 degrees. And just that increase in temperature triggers them to spawn. They're filter feeders. so. Everything happens externally. Um, usually the males will release their sperm first into the water and everyone will filter it and say, oh, something's going on, we're gonna have a party. So then the other shellfish will release their sperm or their eggs. And so everything happens externally and you can see the difference between the sperm and the eggs. Um, it's a highly manipulated situation. We control the amount of sperm that's in the water. Um, we filter the eggs and we're able to do counts. You can see the fertilization take place within a couple hours. So you have an idea of what your fertilization success is um, while you're looking at the eggs. Base scallops are a little bit different. They're hermaphrodites. So they um, emit sperm and eggs from the same individual. So they're a little more tricky to spawn. You have to make sure that they're in separate containers so that they don't fertilize their own eggs. Um, that makes for poor genetics. So, um, you know, once they release their sperm, we have to clean out the container and fill it up with water again and hope that they'll release eggs and just keep everything separate and then manually fertilize it. Um, 
This is what a typical shellfish larvae look like. Um, quite honestly, quahogs, clams, and base scallops look very similar at this stage. Um, these guys are probably about four days old. These are base scallops. Um, the nice part about shellfish larvae is you can look at them under the microscope and you can get an idea of how healthy they are. You can see right through their shells um, and the, the brown pigment is the algae that they're eating. So you can get an idea of how they're feeding, um, if they're clear or open, they're, they're on their way out, they're dying. Um, so this is just a way for us to assess the health. Uh, we drain them down every other day. The larval cycle usually for clams and scallops lasts 10 to 14 days, oysters a little bit longer, usually 21 to 22 days that we hold them in, our, um, in the hatchery. And again, we're feeding them um, a specific amount of algae every day um, and monitoring them for uh, water quality and we add oxygen to the tanks too. Um, so what do we do with the shellfish? Right now I'm just going to talk about the base scallops um, since that's kind of the main part of the program right now. Uh, we do what we call a larval release. So the idea is to produce as many shellfish larvae as possible and release them after they've passed their critical stage of metamorphosis, which happens um, in the hatchery. So these scallops are basically the size of a grain of sand when we release them. Um, the advantages to releasing millions and millions of larvae is that we can time it. So we time it with an incoming tide um, so that the larvae aren't washed out with an outgoing tide. Uh, we're also able to um, pick the location. So we're able to find an area that has good habitat, it has good water quality, um, and do a release. We also consult fishermen, um, other people that are on the harbor that have knowledge, historical knowledge of good areas for recruitment and where um, the scallops tend to thrive. So we take all of that into consideration um, when we do our releases. Our best year that we had before we had the new hatchery, we released around 170 million base scallop larvae. Um, the picture on the right is something that you would see scallops that recruit after about 40 days in the water. They're about 10 millimeters big. We set out spat bags um, just to get an idea about recruitment. A certain percentage of the scallops do recruit in the bag so we can monitor whether or not they stayed in the area and how they might be doing. So Caitlin touched on eelgrass a little bit. Eelgrass is an essential habitat for um, the base scallops, especially when they're small juvenile scallops. They like to attach to the eelgrass to stay off the bottom and away from predators. And eelgrass also acts as a buffer to keep them in the harbor. Um, clams and oysters are a little bit different. Clams like to burrow in the sand. Oysters attach to something, but scallops, once they're a little bit bigger tend to sit on top of the sand and so they can swim but they can also be subject to wave action and wind action so they can they can move around quite a bit. Uh, these pictures are just examples of low nitrogen, high nitrogen and very high nitrogen um, in regards to eelgrass so obviously the one on the left is what we we want and the one on the right um, it's just some macroalgae covering the eelgrass and that creates an anaerobic situation that is not suitable for base scallop recruitment. So they would not survive well in, the, in an area like this. In 2015, I know it says 2016, we did an eelgrass uh, comprehensive survey of Nantucket Harbor and Madiket Harbor. And we took aerials and did ground truthing with underwater video just to give us a baseline of where we are with our eelgrass habitat so that we can move forward and um, conduct future studies and surveys to make sure that we're on the right track for preserving our eelgrass. We can't do restoration for eelgrass until the water quality can support healthy eelgrass. It's just, it won't work. Um, this is a situation that you will see when you have a high density population of scallops without eelgrass in the area. In the winter time, we get high winds, um, and so the scallops can strand themselves on the beach um, because there isn't anything holding the scallops in, um, in the harbor. And so once this happens, um, if the conditions are favorable and the stranding is located, we're able to um, save it. So we can um, you know, put them in totes and put them back up in the water and the survival is pretty good. Um, but this is a very labor intensive practice and we prefer to be proactive and manage our seed um, so that this sort of thing doesn't happen. 
Um, other things that affect bay scallops, we're engaging in green crab studies. Green crabs are an invasive species of Nantucket Harbor. Not only are they predators of shellfish, but they are also um, damage eelgrass shoots. So it's kind of like a double whammy. Um, but we're working with uh, Mariah Mitchell and the Nantucket uh, Land Council um, and Sustainable Nantucket to develop um, different markets for these green crabs. We're um, sustainable is working on developing a crab stock for the restaurants. Um, we are working on shedding green crabs for the soft shell market. And the Land Council and Mariah Mitchell are doing, um, are initiating surveys in the harbor to determine uh, populations uh, around. Uh, last thing I want to touch on, we do get a harmful algae bloom every year in August. This one doesn't get enough press. It's a rust tide. Um, the reason why I think it doesn't get enough press is because it's not harmful to humans, but it is very harmful to shellfish, especially juveniles. It's not a, nutritional, a nutritious algae, so although they ingest it, they don't digest it, so it kind of stunts their growth. They don't really grow during the month of August. Um, it also impedes their respiration uh, so that you know, they don't do very well. Um, there are a lot of studies on the East Coast um, surrounding this bloom that, that are going on. And I think that if you really wanted to quantify the detrimental effects this bloom has on Nantucket, especially in the head of the harbor, you could ask one of the oyster farmers because their small seed, I think, was no one had more than 10% survival last season when we had the bloom. And finally, we do some quahog and clam enhancement. Um, we have been purchasing clams from off island um, with the funding from various organizations and stocking the harbors for uh, the recreational quahog fishery. Uh, you know, eventually I would like to hope that we can produce the clams and quahogs um, from our island to do our own stock enhancement. Uh, so, but this is what's going on right now. We do about 200,000 clams a year. Uh, we have a Shuck It for Nantucket program. Leah Cabral, our assistant biologist, has spearheaded this where she recycles um, oyster shells from all of the restaurants and holds them for restoration. She is going to be giving a talk at the Land Council annual meeting August 8th, Bartlett's Farm, 5 p.m. Um, she has started the first oyster reef in Nantucket in Shimo Bend, and she has... Whoop, um, she has deposited an acre's worth of shell um, in Shimo Bend to create this oyster reef. So if you want more details about that, come to that meeting and she'll get down to the nitty gritty details. And lastly, outreach, education, and volunteer opportunities. Um, you know, the, the, the hatchery has provided this awesome platform for us to teach kids and um, host volunteers and visiting scientists um, to help us with our harbor issues. So if you guys have any questions or you want a tour, feel free to come down. We're there every day until about 2 or 3 p.m. starting at 6 a.m. Um, and we'd be happy to give you a tour. Thank you. Any questions for Tara before she steps down? Um, the best way to report a stranding is to call the Natural Resources Office. So the green color is 2015. That's the eelgrass coverage that is most recent. Um, and the purple is the eelgrass that we used to have all the way back to 1995. So in terms of percentages, we've had about a 35% loss. Yeah, I think that the harbor is constantly changing. I think that there are so many variables that play into whether it's a successful fishing year or not. Um, again, you know, if the natural populations are spawning on an outgoing tide or that the habitat isn't favorable for recruitment, 
it can definitely affect, affect the year. Also, the number of people fishing, the fishing effort has been down. Um, so that also plays into it as well. Great. Thanks. Um, again, I just saw a couple more questions. We'll save them for later because we just got we to gotta move on. Before we move on to our next speaker, I want to um, just follow up on Jeff's comment there um, and sort of echo the intensity of the slide. Just five years ago, the extent of eelgrass that was in the harbor was fairly significant. Outside the harbor, a lot of that loss is probably due to shoaling. But just these areas right here and here are now completely devoid of eelgrass. That's one of the things we wanted to present to you today. We wanted to give you a snapshot of the water quality, some good, a lot of it bad. We wanted to give you a snapshot of the eelgrass. We're on a fairly discouraging downward trend. And then we now also want to move into, for our discussions, some of the things that we're doing about it in terms of trying to improve water quality. So with that, I'd like to introduce Roberto Santa Maria, who's got the most uh, exciting talk, because it always, what, what, he, he can explain what his, uh, he had a great joke for us the other day on what his talk was going to be. <laughs> yeah, you can't say that out loud. Uh, Roberto, um, I have to grab my thing again. Roberto came to us, uh, Roberto, you came about a year and a half ago, right? Two years ago. Two years ago. Um, Roberto is um, our health, head health agent at the health department. Roberto has a master's in the uh, School of Public Health at uh, BU. He also has a master's in business from BU. So I don't really know why he's doing public health because he did do a lot more with his business degree and say goodbye to all of this stress and pain that he deals with, but um, he is also con currently pursuing a doctoral degree at John Hopkins University. I've had the pleasure to work with Roberto for the t past few years, and I must say it's, he's been a great addition to the town in Nantucket. So please, won't you welcome Roberto Santa Maria, please. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Well, wow, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm glad all of you came down here to see me on this beautiful rainy day. So I'm here to talk about the fun side of our, eel, our eelgrass and our harbor and our nutrition. Uh, the, the joke, you can throw in your own word on this one, but is that I have the crappiest presentation of all. So with that, <laughs> So my, quest, my conversation here is to explain to you how septic systems are affecting our harbor. Uh, right now, the septic systems in the Nantucket Harbor watershed specifically, uh, we're not going to move into uh, Madiket, Hummock Pond, Mayakami, because right now we're looking to just talk about the, this Nantucket Harbor watershed. So septic systems in general is uh, what many people don't realize is when you flush it, it doesn't go away. Um, in the harbor areas here, past what we currently have sewered, everything that comes out of every drain, out of your sinks, unless you have a gray water system, whatever's coming out of your sinks, your dishwashers, your laundry, your bathrooms, your tubs, everything goes into the first step, which is your septic tank, no, the label number two here. The septic tank, all right, just a second, just so that I can see what I'm doing here too. Uh, the septic tank, what that does is that it actually collects everything that comes in, uh, that comes out of the drain, and it separates it. It separates everything to three separate layers, which are very nicely called the scum layer and the sludge layer at the bottom. Um, and in the center is your clear effluent area. That clear effluent is what moves on. Uh, the scum layer at the top is things that float. Sludge is the things that drop to the bottom. We we'll, won't get deeper into that. From there, it moves on to your, what's called the distribution box and your leach field. The, dis the leach field from here is that effluent, that clear layer that's in the septic system. That layer is mostly, let me step back, I'm, I apologize. In the septic system, what currently, currently happens in your average septic system is anaerobic digestion. 
So the tank right now, as it creates sewer gases and things like that, it kills off almost all of the oxygen that's in that tank. So the same oxygen that we want in our harbors are not present in your septic system. So in that anaerobic digestion, it creates um, ammonia, it creates methane, it creates other forms of these uh, carbon materials, nitrogen materials, and especially the nitrates that come, that come out. Nitrates, a uh, nitrate is typically N, uh, nitrogen bound to an oxygen, uh, nitrates and nitrites. And the thing about that molecule is that it's really small. So that molecule is highly mobile. It can move uh, within really small filters, uh, filters that are like one micron still won't block nitrite nitrites. So it's a very important nutrient of, of concern for us. So from there, everything that's in that effluent goes into your leach field. That leach field, what that does is it releases all this water, all this fluid, and that percolates down through the sand. Well, why is that part important? Right beneath the leach field, you create a level of bacteria. We call this the biomat. The biomat breaks down in aerobic digestion, everything that's coming out of there. That breaks it down to create um, nitrogen gas so that you can, the nitrogen can actually off gas and it won't make it into our groundwater. So, if I can move on. Nice. Why doesn't it show the slide? Okay. There we go. So why is this important? The effluent that drops down and starts recharging the, the groundwater, that groundwater is an area that we call the saturation zone. It's an area that has, uh, it's basically a slurry of just groundwater, fluids, things like that, everything that percolates, rain, uh, fertilizer runoff, uh, septic system effluent, all of that drops down. Why do you care about it? because your drinking water well pulls from the same groundwater. So it's very important to think about what it is that's going into your septic tank, what you're flushing. Even if you are on a sewer, what you're flushing ends up in the sewage treatment plant. So if you're fl do not flush things like bleach, do not flush uh, chemicals of some sorts. You know, a lot of people flush their, uh, anti their old antibiotics. Huge no-no that'll kill off all the bacteria in the septic tank. Um, and it completely imbalances the tank, and a lot of that goes out into the flea field, also creating, uh, from a public health perspective, the part we're worried about with the antibiotics is antibiotic resistance. You're creating some of these superbug situations. So why, so what we're really looking into is in order to prevent these sorts of chemicals to get into the water and this sort of nitrogen, we did a new regulation about two years ago, uh, right after I started, that created a, what's called a nitrogen sensitive area. So it is the Nantucket Harbor watershed. Everything that's in the red is called, is this what we call the zone B. Everything that's in the orange, yellowish area is zone A. Zone A means 100% of everything that's going into the groundwater is flowing in the direction of the harbor. Zone B is that it may not be 100%, but some percent, a great majority of the percentage is also moving towards your harbor. So what do these new regulations do? These new regulations mean that Upon any failure of the septic system, any transfer of property, any new construction, if you're renovating your house, if you're adding bedrooms, things like that, you need to upgrade it to an innovative and alternative septic system. An innovative alternative septic system is known as nationally as a nutrient reduction system. What that does is that it actually removes the levels of nitrogen, the levels of phosphorus, things like that, from the effluent that's actually going down into the groundwater. So how does it do this? So this is an example of a microfast system. The fast system, what you'll see is instead of it just being your basic tank, it actually has these multiple compartment areas. One, the biggest thing to take away from all of this is what's labeled number three. That is your air supply line. So you'll, if you have one of these systems installed, you'll, there's a little fan that you might hear if you're in the vicinity. What that is doing is it's pumping air into your oxygen system, I mean into your septic system. 
bringing in oxygen to that bacteria, creating that aerobic digestion that you need. So nationally, you might hear these called advanced treatment units. What it's doing is that it's actually mimicking in a very small scale what happens in your basic sewage treatment plant. What happens in your sewage treatment plant here on Nantucket is much more advanced. Uh, we have a very good sewage treatment plant here. But this one is your very basic in-house one. So with creating that aerobic digestion, it actually is able to reduce the nitrogen levels, specifically nitrogen, by at least 50%. Some of these actually reduce it by up to around 90, um, depend, based on a new uh, report by the EPA. That is 50% less nitrogen entering the harbor and the groundwater area. Every little bit counts. So why is it so important to really think about all of this? Because if you notice, the town as a whole, the, the main downtown part of the town, is in one of the watersheds. It's in the harbor watershed. And then everything that has a black outline is the new proposed sewer, sewer line. So why are, we always, why are you always hearing me talk about sewer? Why am I always pushing sewer? Well, an advanced septic system reduces 50% of the nitrogen, just nitrogen. Sewer removes 100% of the nitrogen, 100% of phosphorus, 100% of all the other chemicals that drop down. Prevents all of that from entering our harbor. The sewer being here mostly at the head will hopefully reverse the trend that Caitlin was talking about where some of the trend was the water, water quality was dropping. And it increase, with the increase of the flow from the jetties, that cleaner water will also move down towards the head creating more clean water moving up towards the head of the harbor. So I think this is my last slide. OK, yeah. So what it's really important to take away from all of this is, just in a quick nutshell, the, if you have a septic system that is, and you're not in one of these sewer districts, the, please take a night, OK, please take a, inspection and take a look at what you have in your septic system. Please make sure that what you're flushing into your septic systems are safe. Uh, there is the EPA website has a very good list of things that are called septic smart, um, septic, septic smart products. And if you do have an innovative and alternative system, make sure you have an operations and maintenance agreement. The operations and the O&M agreement that we look for uh, makes sure that it's actually removing the amount of nitrogens and the nutrients that we want it to remove. If you're if you're in one of the sewer connection areas, you will be getting a con you will be getting contacted by our uh, wastewater uh, group that's going to be doing the sewer connections for you. Uh, mainly because it will remove that 100% section. And please always make sure about when you're doing, when you're cooking, when you're doing things like that, just a quick plug for the for our sewer department, fats, oils, and grease do not go down the drain. When you cook bacon, you have that nice layer of fat, don't pour it down the drain. That kills septic systems, and it does even worse things to sewers. So do not pour that down the drain. Put it in your glass bottle, a jar, <laughs> cap it up, throw it away. That is our, probably one of our single most damaging portions to our sewer systems right now. Um, with that, I will probably, I will just close it off here because I can go on for another six hours. Uh, so I can take some quick questions. <coughs> yes, sir. I got a question. What about the stormwater? How do you handle this and care of that? How do you really bring all the Yes, so the question is, uh, how, is how are we handling stormwater? Well, actually, right, right now, if you're in one of the private areas, if you're in one of your, um, if, for example, if you have a large property, a lot of the stormwater is spread out across your lawn, and that does take care of the nitrogen. The very first layer in the soil is called the A layer, and that will reduce nitrogen. However, the areas that are closer to the roads, the DPW right now is redesigning all of our our stormwater systems. And Em's going to talk about that. And then Emily is apparently having a very big presentation about this. <laughs> so I will let Emily answer that question for you. <laughs> yes. yes, sir. Thank you. 
trying to get people to regenerate their uh, septic and cesspools uh, in places like uh, Manakin and uh, all over the island. So the question is, if you're shutting down your septic system for the winter, things like that, are there way, is the town doing anything to uh, help people regenerate these systems? Unfortunately, the answer is no on this. Um, if we were to start going property by property to make sure that everyone is taking care of their septic systems, I would do nothing else. Um, it would really take at least three people full time uh, going to all these properties. However, what we can do is get the information out there. Let people know about, make sure your septic system is pumped uh, correctly. Um, we have plenty of pumpers on the island here. The list is in our office. Uh, septic inspections are really important. So if you are shutting down your, your septic tank and your, your house for the winter or multiple years, uh, make sure you have the system inspected before you reopen your house. Uh, that inspection, uh, for example, in the Harbor Watershed, we actually re require that people inspect their system once every five years. But if we do recommend, though, that you inspect it at least every two to three years when you get it pumped, um, mainly because you want to make sure that the system is working correctly. Um, and if you have an operation and maintenance agreement if with one of the innovative and alternative systems, somebody is going once every six months to make sure that the system is working correctly. Yes, sir. Is there any possibility of retrofitting a Yes, so the question is, is there a possible way of retrofitting septic systems? Uh, it is on a case-by-case -case basis, but the answer is yes. There is a way to retrofit certain tanks. Um, sometimes it's as simple as dropping the fast system into it if you have a 2,000-gallon tank or larger. Other times that, that second tank that, we're talk that I talked about can be just dropped in series right next to the tank that you already have. You can keep your current leach field and you can keep the current tank. There are many times that you can do that. Yes, ma'am. Um, it just seems to me as the town is thinking about how to educate people better, especially renters who use properties because of I mean, things like pills and grease down the drain, you know, and having your system inspected every year. I'm sitting here going, ah, you know, and I don't know how many other people here weren't aware of all of those, but I'm sure residents and renters alike. So is there, you know, is there some kind of card or something? If you're doing that already, it's a multifaceted yes. So we we have been I have been speaking with uh, the Nantucket Association of Real Estate Brokers, where we, I have been press, pressing this information, passing this information to them, so that they can pass on to renters. Um, I have not been able to get to a, a one pager or a or a door hanger or something that can be passed out. Uh, but all the information, everything I've mentioned today and more is available on the town's website. Um, I know a lot of people don't necessarily like our website, um, but it is a lot, of our, a lot of the information is there. It's worth mining that, in, that website for the information. <laughs> so, but the answer is yes. We are working on getting this education out to everybody. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. I get to introduce myself now. Where did I go to school? <laughs> University of Vermont, and I miss it. I'll tell you that. I have the honor of talking about uh, one of the other uh, main nutrient inputs to the water bodies on Nantucket, and that is through fertilizer. Um, We've talked about the problem in terms of some of the results of excess nutrients, excess nitrogen in our water bodies. And as I said, we're now moving into some of the, uh, the solutions, or at least the strategies, um, for tackling the, um, the issue. And I'm just going to go into some of what uh, we are doing, the Land Council, what the landscaping industry is doing, what the Board of Health and the Natural uh, Resources Department is doing in terms of education, outreach, and enforcement of fertilizer use on the island. Now let's see, who's got that? There it is. 
My uh, landscaping buddies cringe when I uh, show this photo. They actually get very upset. Um, I, see, I see my buddy Steve back there. <laughs> this, I do this photo um, as a reason to um, actually explain that it's very rare when you actually have a landscape. It is actually landscaping the water. This is, um, could probably only happen if they were landscaping and fertilizing in the dead of winter and it was pouring two inches of, of rain and they were using a 100% quick release fertilizer. My point is to you, not all fertilizer is bad. There are ways to do it appropriately and that is what we are trying to strive for right now with the landscaping community and with the homeowners in terms of doing it right. This is our harbor watershed, as Roberto had said. Um, just a quick note, uh, almost this entire area, going back to Roberto's presentation, is under sewer. Shimo is now going to be sewered. Everything after Shimo is what he was stating has the hopeful potential of getting an alternative innovative septic system. So that's the town's approach in terms of the septic and the sewer. all the way out over time. Watershed based, although we are focusing on certain key parts of the watersheds. Wide. Just a little example of some of the development which you're all familiar with that has occurred throughout the years, but this is just essentially 19 years. Uh, Pacamo Head, a fairly popular place all the way from um, the early and mid 1900s, so you don't get a large amount of increased development per se. You had some bigger houses here and there, but my point of the slide is you have a lot more lawns and gardens. Here, 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 here. I also want to show that this is a um, what we call a cluster subdivision. And this was open space that was created through the cluster subdivision. So going back to the watershed, the other strategy which we haven't touched upon here is obviously if it's not built, if it's not developed, if it's not landscaped and put into conservation, that's probably one of the primary ways to protect our water bodies. And we've done such a great job of that through the land bank and through the Conservation Foundation. So, we are very lucky that these institutions have been created through the years, but now we have to deal with the existing land use and future land use as well. So what did the town do as a result of um, many, many years of discussions from the 1900s to when it sort of pretty much culminated at a town meeting, oh, probably eight years ago now, um, through an article that was looking, uh, in my opinion, they're used completely outright on the island. And what the town did was create an um, advisory committee to essentially discuss potential fertilizer regula regulations and other initiatives um, to decrease damaging fertilizer use uh, throughout the island. What the Board of Health regulations do, which were enacted uh, approximately three, four years ago, this is just a snapshot of what they are. It limits the type, the timing, and the amounts of fertilizer. Uh, it mandates a defined, essentially, a minimum amount of slow water insoluble nitrogen per application. That's probably one of the more important things of the regulations. The regulations require that 75% of the nitrogen in the product has to be slow release, essentially water insoluble. Uh, you can go to more higher rates of quick release if you decrease the total amount of fertilizer that you're using. On average though, what we are shooting for from many of the landscaping com companies and many of the homeowners to just simply do a 75% slow release product. Um, it also, in terms of the first item, um, it limits uh, a total nitrogen application of three pounds per 1,000 square feet per year. 
This item is more as it relates to the freshwater bodies, but there are certain situations where definitely phosphorus comes into play in uh, marine bodies, more so in the estuarine interface with the freshwater meeting the saltwater. Um, no phosphorus is allowed unless a soil test shows a deficiency. Every gardener that you see out there right now that is putting a rose tone product, a plant tone product, an organic product that has phosphorus in it, and they're putting it down, which I saw about five of them today, without a soil test that says there's a, a deficiency in the soil, they are not consistent with the regulations. It's a very important part, something that we're going to look into a little bit further, but really what we are most focusing on, the nonprofit community and the town, was the first two items. Finally, it utilized BMPs. So the regulation um, allows certain things to occur in sort of uh, strategies and protocols as long as the landscaper conforms to the best management practices for fertilizer use on Nantucket Island. This is a document that took about two, three years to produce. Um, it was industry driven with nonprofit support and town support. It was peer reviewed by experts from Cornell, from uh, I'm, this is probably one of the, the things that I'm most proud of that uh, I participated in, in, in the island. We also set up, after we instituted the regulations, um, I have the, let me step back, I have the ability as a nonprofit person to say some things that the town can't say, town employees can't say. I was going to come up here and say the world is going to hell and we're all doomed, but I do want to focus on the, on the positive stuff. Um, the, the, the town took a long time to get this together, particularly as it relates to the advisory committee. We got the regulations through through the Board of Health, a very positive Board of Health, but what we didn't have was an advisory committee and the will and the initiative of the town until a critical mass of voices really demanded it from the, from, um, the elected officials. So finally, we got a fertilizer advisory committee together. It has a large part of uh, Roberto and Jeff are on it, but what's most important is that the landscaping and golf industries are, are participating in this. I came here on the island about 2001, and a lot of this conversation was an us versus them conversation, which I didn't necessarily like, but was, got drawn into it. In a scene is individuals lead, from these industries leading the discussion and trying to improve the practices of their peers, which I think is very, very important. Um, Steve Collette from Ernst Landscaping is on the committee. Um, who else? Is on it? Um, Mark Lucas from the Nantucket Golf Club, Ben, ben Shampoo from Shampoo Landscaping, um, Fritz McClure is a private citizen on it, Mike Miserelli from G&M Landscaping, I think I've covered everybody, right? And then Greg Wraith. Um, we're also welcoming new individuals to improve that conversation, to improve that outreach, to improve the discussion. So what do we do as an advisory committee? So we're an advisory committee to the Board of Health. We make future recommendations on the regulations or um, that's potentially down the road, but what we're really trying to do is we're trying to work with the town, work with the Board of Health to improve their education, to improve their outreach, and to improve their enforcement. Enforcement is probably the most critical step in the regulatory process. However, it is also one of the most difficult parts of the regulatory process as, as well. Um, there's certain resources that are available to the town, Natural Resources Department and the Health Department, in terms of personnel, but that's only fin finite. If I had my druthers, I'd have about six, seven people working on this for them, but there's limited resources um, available to them. There's also limitations in terms of what enforcement can and can't do. We can't go on to private property. And when I say we, I'm not even allowed to. It's just the town of Nantucket personnel that can do the enforcement. Um, they cannot go on to private property. All they can do is from a public way, look at the landscaping um, individuals, make sure that they're doing it in conformance look in their bags. One thing that I didn't mention as well is that the first step that they do do in their enforcement, they ask if the landscaper is certified. There's a certification course per the regulations that every landscaper must take. Every landscaper who applies fertilizer in a commercial capacity must take and receive certification from the town. That's one of the critical steps that they have going forward. Knowing that uh, enforcement can only go so far, what we as a community, um, through the nonprofit community, but also the advisory committee as well, um, 
have done is we've uh, set up classes and workshops. We've held a fertilizer um, uh, calibration, uh, ca uh, spreader calibration course in the springtime that was very well attended by a lot of the landscapers. It was actually as part of their certification for renewing credits for some of the individuals that hadn't been certified in the past. We've done social media on the, we've done um, public surf service announcements on social media, on the radio. We filmed a short little 30 second bit that's um, now um, being shown at Dreamland Theater um, before some of the movies. Essentially just trying to talk about the regulations, talk about the importance of fer appropriate fertilizer applications and things of that nature. And then we've also, as you guys know, we've done a bunch of education outreach materials. This is a sheet that's up there along with a, a number of other materials that we did in concert with the Pond Coalition in the town of Nantucket. So, if I would like you to take one, th one thing besides visiting the propagation lab, the other thing is um, how many individuals in this room have their properties maintained by a professional landscaper? So, less than half or so. Um, I go to homeowner association meetings and it's almost 100%. So we also do a lot of outreach through that. The most important thing that people can do is talk to your landscaper, engage in a dialogue with your landscaper. Ask your landscaper, are they certified by the town of Nantucket? Are they following the town of Nantucket's best management practices for fertilizer application? Your landscaper says yes, you nod your head, you go okay. If you're unsure of their true answer, say, do you think you could have a little conversation with the town of Nantucket or the land council just to talk about it a little bit further? We're there for you. The town's there for you. Not in a police sense, in an encouraging sense to make sure they're doing it right, make sure that they have the opportunity to learn that all that, all that they can learn. Um, this is another aspect of the BMPs, the best management practices, which is fairly critical to some of the um, uh, uh, fertilizer practices and analyzing um, sort of uh, what is necessary and what isn't necessary to put on. Um, are they testing your soil to see what nutrients are needed? Can't necessarily get a good read in terms of how much nitrogen is needed um, with a soil test, but you can draw to some conclusions. But you can certainly tell phosphorus and some other parameters which would help um, the turf and some of the garden plants as well. Quite simply put, can they use less fertilizer? There are a number of individuals that are landscaping out there that are well below three pounds per square feet, three pounds per 1,000 square feet per year. You'll be surprised that actually a number of them are golf courses. That is actually because they're almost like caretakers. They're there every day, day in, day out, week in, week out, and have the ability to do very small, minute applications two weeks apart. And then two weeks later, they come and say, should we do another one? Two weeks and come, they say, should we do another one? A lot of landscaping companies don't have that ability if they have a lot of clientele, I understand that. However, if a landowner simply wants them to try out a reduced amount of fertilizer and see what happens, they should try that, try that initiative. If you don't get the results that you want and you wanna go back to the BMPs, go back to what the regulation threshold is, go ahead and do that. But I really recommend can they use less fertilizer and quite frankly, in some areas, and I'm not a landscaping professional and I try to um, state that as much as I can, in some areas, my background is uh, botany, landscaping, and farming. In some areas on this island, you can go below one th th three pounds per uh, thousand square feet if your soil is appropriate, if you have the organic matter that's available to you. Um, the, 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 this is the same thing in terms of um, the testing your soil, uh, essentially just a uh, uh, performance test. And then again, one of the most things that we as the land council are going to move into in the future is trying to move away from turf lawns, trying to move away from non-native um, perennial landscapes to actually move into, again, a uh, landscape that mimics the natural environment that is drought intolerant, that is drought tolerant and doesn't need as much fertilizer as necessary. You walk in those, the moors, those landscapes are absolutely gorgeous in my opinion. Granted, I'm not saying that you're entire landscape should be that. There's also some public health issues in terms of ticks. There's issues in terms of fire. We understand that, but there are certain areas where you don't need the expanse of lawn as we see in some of these areas of the harbor watershed if you're concerned about potential nutrient contamination. Uh, finally, I'm just gonna zoom through this real quick. Um, we have uh, an 
uh, an initiative that we've been doing at the advisory committee in terms of vendors. We always get the question, well, why can't you just mandate the companies on the island that are selling the fertilizer, mandate that they sell only the appropriate products? We as a community are not allowed to. State law prohibits us doing that. It's essentially with um, inter-municipal commerce law. I think we could probably, if we really tried and worked with our representatives, maybe we could work with them because I don't see any individual that buys fertilizer on Nantucket, they would go over to Chatham and use it. <laughs> so it doesn't make a lot of sense. What's bought on Nantucket is used on Nantucket. That law is more because if someone in Wellesley is buying a product, they might be going and using it in Newton. Something like that it makes a little bit more sense. But I think we could do something here. That being said, vendor participation. Again, I have the ability to say things that other people can't say. Uh, island Lumber has been the best company to work with so far on the island in terms of interest of carrying the appropriate products. Now, um, in the past two years, the products have really become more readily available to the community, um, to the vendors. So there's products that are out there, they're knowledgeable, they know what the BMPs are, they know what the regulations are. Some other examples, uh, marine lumber, they don't have one single product that is compliant for turf application. I see a hand and I'll get that. Two, three weeks ago, there wasn't one single product that was compliant. So hopefully that hand tells me that they got something more. Um, in terms of an environmentally uh, uh, appropriate product uh, that the land council is recommending, all of the work that we've done to date um, since 2009 hasn't been organic versus synthetic. Nitrogen is nitrogen is nitrogen. But one product that I do like, I use it on my own laws. It's an 80% slow release product. Um, it has no phosphorus in it, it is 900. This is an Espoma product that is sold at Island Lumber. If you're interested in it, um, I'd uh, recommend it. Some of the landscaping companies tell me it's a little difficult to use because it doesn't have a uniform pellet size, which is a little easier in terms of spreading. However, for small scale lawns such as mine, it's, it's fairly easy to use, but some of the other companies might not work. Besides that, there are other organic products that are available, and there's a tremendous amount of synthetic products that are available that meet the BMPs and meet the slow release requirements. Um, just to finalize and to go back on that, on that eelgrass issue, I just want to give you a little bit of a, another echo of what the eelgrass is. Here's an area off of Pulpis, Pulpis Harbor coming out of the Pulpis Channel. This is Quays right here. Fulling Mill and Ful Folgers Marsh come out here. This is 2001. Lush eelgrass, lush eelgrass coming up all the way. That's our eelgrass in 2017. Very spotty, very spotty. Going back again, look how dense this eelgrass is. Anybody skull up right off Fulling Mill? Or used to at least? I used to, it hasn't been so good lately. That's what the eelgrass looks now. If I went to the east, and showed you some more pictures, particularly that one that I, that I followed up in in terms of that area off of Montemo Pier, completely devoid of yield. There's something fairly significant, fairly serious going on. And in fact, if I showed you a photo, not just from 2001, but from 2000, the grass looked, still looked fairly, fairly healthy. So we're in a fairly critical pe time period right now to do the most that we can to get to uh, get our water quality levels still consistent in certain areas and then improve them in others. Finally, questions, but I do want to end on this very sad picture. This is from Sunday off Pacamo. The amount of eelgrass that I saw off Pacamo that had roots, shoots, and that was healthy, but unfortunately was not rooted to the substrate, was astounding for me. I have never seen this before myself. I have one is a hypothesis. The second reason I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. First hypothesis is that we also have not just absence application of eelgrass, we have uh, eelgrass that is really not healthy. We have eelgrass in certain areas off of Madiket and Tuckernuck that is, uh, it's almost this deep, I mean this high, so four feet in height. You go out in some of these areas now, the eelgrass is one foot, one and a half feet. I think these certain eelgrass areas, and they're just um, facing certain stresses that don't allow them to root as strong as others. The second more obvious reason, the amount of boats that we have in this harbor is astounding and the amount of prop scour that happens in this harbor is fairly discouraging. This is an easterly facing shore, straight to town. 
That's where some of the heavy yield. And there's a lot of boat traffic in those areas. Jeff's going to talk about some of that boat use. Questions? Yeah, um, I've with the town to fund that eelgrass analysis um, through the years uh, through Charlie Costello at MassDEP. And one of the things that he showed us was historical imagery of areas that were put onto sewer. And it wasn't a heavily landscaped in terms of lawn area, but it was more of a, uh, a septic versus sewer issue that was put onto sewer. And after several years of sewer and some other initiatives, that were done in terms of boat use, eelgrass went right back up. So if you have the appropriate water quality and some other factors involved, you can get your eelgrass back. Yes? Go ahead. If a There's products that are upwards of 80 to 90 percent fast release uh, available. Correct. Island lumber is very good. Yes. Absolutely. I think the reasons why I did bring, bring it up. Um, one of the things you could do is tomorrow you walk into Marine Home Center and say, show me a product that's compliant. I, I'm, I'm being completely honest. And that's one thing that you do. And they will say, I don't have any products. Walk out and say, I'm going to Island Lumber. <laughs> Go ahead. Certification for the store, you know, for the stores. It says like, you know, uh, land council uh, certified or land council endorsed, uh, you know, because of. Yeah, so the next step, it sort of goes on along with yours, um, but the, the question was can we create something that says it is BMP certified? What the advisory committee is thinking about doing is getting a sticker available or assigned, but probably a sticker for the companies to say, can you put these on every single bag of fertilizer that is compliant? But also like on the doorway or something. And then signs as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we got to wrap it up. We'll, we'll do other questions at the end. And now I have the uh, great honor to introduce my colleague, Emily Molden at the Land Council. She is our resource ecologist. And just um, a, a word for Emily. There's nothing that the Land Council um, would achieve without, uh, without the help of Emily. She is really a core part of um, what we do, um, both our advocacy work, our research work, and our education and outreach work. So I'm so pleased to be working with Emily. She came in 2004. 2004, I came in 2001. It's such an honor to work with her and be a, a teammate of hers. So Emily is going to be talking about some of the Land Council's initiatives working with the DPW and other entities um, as it relates to stormwater uh, on the island. And for those who are interested, I also attended the University of Vermont. And I also miss it, Cormac. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for coming to join us tonight. We're really excited to be hosting this forum and definitely appreciate your enthusiasm and interest in the current state of the harbor and in all that we have going on. So my topic this evening is not particularly glamorous and I do not pretend to be a stormwater expert by any means, but I do want to spend a few moments talking about Nantucket's stormwater system 
and an exciting new project that we're initiating to take a closer look at the impacts that it might be having on the harbor, as well as some potential improvements moving forward and how we hope to work with the town on some of those. So what is stormwater runoff? Stormwater runoff is simply what we call precipitation or snow melt that comes down and is forced to travel over the surface of the ground. And we typically speak of stormwater runoff in more built up areas and urban locations that have a higher <coughs> amount of impervious surfaces. And that's what causes that surface flow over the ground. So things like roads, driveways, parking lots, even roofs and sidewalks, they prevent that precipitation from naturally absorbing into the ground where the soil and vegetation can not only help to absorb and store it and prevent flooding, but also does a remarkable job at cleaning and filtering any contaminants out of it. But in the absence of that, when it interfaces with these hard and pervious surfaces, it runs off and flows over the ground. So where does stormwater runoff go? Well. <coughs> On Nantucket, as with most towns and cities, stormwater in the roadways and parking lots is directed into storm drains. And we all know that water follows the path of least resistance. So as it enters these storm drains, it then goes into any number of a variety of infrastructure units that can be found underground. In their most basic form, these storm drains will basically consist of a uh, hole in the ground where the stormwater accumulates. It's just brought off of the street to prevent flooding and puddling, and it allows the stormwater time to just infiltrate naturally into the ground around it. So sometimes these catch basins will just be isolated and not connected to anything else, and they're primarily just a place for that stormwater to go off of the roadways and those impervious surfaces. But when they are connected to a greater network of stormwater infrastructure or stormwater system, then they typically will also be connected to some kind of trunk line with an inflow and an outflow. And often what you'll see is some kind of a settling basin that allows at least some of the sediment and the solids that's being carried off of the streets and those <coughs> impervious surfaces to settle out before moving on to its final destination. Now that's important because a lot of pollutants and contaminants that we find in stormwater actually travel with those solids and that sediment. So by trying to allow that to settle out of the stormwater, we are removing a certain amount of pollution from it. However, they obviously require a certain amount of maintenance. They can fill up pretty quickly during storms and so they need to be pumped or emptied. Otherwise, an all too familiar site is stormwater drains that are actually overflowing and not, act not really taking in any of the stormwater. So on Nantucket, the stormwater infrastructure downtown leads to a series of outfall pipes that empty into the harbor. And that's not uncommon in coastal communities. Most stormwater systems are channeling water underground to either streams or rivers or places that facilities that can handle the amount of water that typically runs off of their impervious surfaces during a storm. So around downtown in Nantucket Harbor, you'll find these outfall pipes that might simply be coming out of a bulkhead, or in some cases even just emerge out on a beach and the stormwater uh, in, uh, flows into the harbor directly from those locations. So the town of Nantucket's stormwater system consists of about 20 different outfall pipes, give or take a few. There might be a few more than that. And they are lining the downtown area, the, this basin of Nantucket Harbor, and they are connected to an intricate network of pipes and stormwater infrastructure all throughout the streets of our downtown. A lot of this infrastructure is antiquated, it's pretty old and quite frankly insufficient for the amount of development that the island has seen and the downtown area continues to see. The other thing about stormwater infrastructure in general is that when it was first designed and put in, most often it was really designed with flooding in mind. It was to deal with the nuisance of having a lot of water come down at once during a rain event and wanting to get it off the streets. So secondarily, as you saw with the previous diagram, 
there are catch basins and such that deals with removing solids and sediment from stormwater. But most stormwater infrastructure that is at all as old as, or near as old as Nantucket's is, really wasn't designed to remove or treat other contaminants or pollutants, and especially not for nutrient removal. Um, so that's kind of an ongoing issue that we're looking to address. The town of Nantucket has implemented a stormwater improvement program. Over the years, they've been starting to prioritize different outfalls that they're looking to upgrade and different areas of the downtown where they want to improve the infrastructure. Uh, some progress has been made on some of these phases. There was a lot of uh, upgrades that took place down at Children's Beach around 2009 and a few other areas of the downtown area. Um, but it is important to keep in mind that again, a lot of these upgrades are focused at capacity and removal of sediments and solids. And you're really looking at a whole nother step uh, to, to try to remove some of the additional nutrients or contaminants that can enter the harbor through the stormwater. We have been really encouraged and pleased working with the DPW, the new director and deputy director this year at their enthusiasm and interest in focusing on the stormwater infrastructure downtown. So that's really um, great to see. We've been looking forward to working with them more on this issue. So over the last several years, for a decade or so, the Lane Council and the town have really been focusing on harbor health and on the pollutants that are potentially impacting the harbor ecosystem. And in years past, the nutrient concentrations and the amount of pollutant that's been entering the harbor through the stormwater has really been accounted for using models that can approximate those values based on land use. So looking at how much commercial versus residential or industrial development do you have in your downtown area, and there are models that sort of show us what we could expect for pollution and the runoff from those areas. And they do a good job of approximating those values. But we decided over the last year that maybe it was time to take a closer look at what our actual uh, stormwater and impervious surfaces downtown were emptying into our harbor. So the Land Council joined up with the town and the DPW this year and with support from the Nantucket Yacht Club we are beginning a study to sample some of these stormwater outfall pipes in these areas to get a better understanding of what pollutants are entering the harbor. And we weren't about to start with all 20 or 23 of them. We didn't want to bite off more than we could chew. So we just selected three to start with this year. And I'll get into some of the challenges with this project. But uh, just to talk a little bit about the areas that we are starting to sample um, this summer. We selected Children's Beach, the Easy Street outfall, and also the outfall that's located at the town pier, just down here on Washington Street across from the town parking lot near the Marine Fisheries Building. So the Children's Beach area was important to us because it, um, the outfall which was just upgraded in I think 2009, it encompasses really the largest con contributing area of the downtown as far as stormwater goes. When those upgrades were made in 2009, pretty much all of the Brant Point area was redirected into the Children's Beach outfall. All of the uh, developed area along Easton Street, south to Broad Street. And the other thing that's interesting about this outfall and this stormwater system in this area is that it also drains a large portion of the Lily Pond watershed. So back when this area was first developed, a lot of the wetlands in the area around Lily Pond um, was funneled into the stormwater system in order to help dry up the land so that it could be built on. So we're really interested in what's coming out of the outfall here because it's not only showing us what's entering the harbor from the impervious surface of this part of town, but also the Lily Pond watershed. And this is just a general blueprint that we we do have, the town does have, of the stormwater infrastructure. It's a whole network of pipes and catch basins and storm drains underground throughout the downtown area. <coughs> so Easy Street <coughs> is another location that we've chosen to sample because it encompasses 
uh, a lot of the most heavily trafficked streets in the downtown area between the uh, Steamboat Wharf and Strait Wharf where the ferry traffic comes in as well. Um, a couple of years ago, you may have noticed that the bulkhead down at Easy Street was upgraded. That was really part of a coastal resiliency product project. And while they were doing the repairs to the bulkhead, they did put on some um, tide valves to try to prevent high tides from flowing into the stormwater system. But unfortunately, they weren't able to coordinate upgrades with the actual stormwater infrastructure at the same time. So we're also really interested in, in what's entering the harbor at that location. And this is one that's also easily accessible. Again, you can see the complicated uh, stormwater system that the DPW is working with. So the town pier, and this is sort of an interesting site that I'll come back to in just a couple more slides, but there is an outfall just adjacent to the town pier down the street here across from the parking lot um, that essentially drains the water from that parking lot and a couple of storm drains in Washington Street itself. It's a pretty small area, but one of the reasons that we're particularly interested in this site is because it's a place that the town is looking to <coughs> spend some time and money um, with some upgrades in the near future. So we wanted to jump on board and try to assist them with some additional information on um, inputs. So the sampling program really consists of two parts when we are going out to these sites. We're not only sampling the water that's coming out of these outfalls, but we also need to calculate the rate of flow and figure out how much water is moving out of these areas. And that's important because ultimately we're looking for the load of a particular nutrient or contaminant. So to just know the concentration in the water isn't enough. We also need to know how much water is moving out of that site in order to get a better understanding of what's entering the harbor. This is kind of challenging because we're also looking for specific events to take place. The way that the stormwater system works is it drains rainfall during a storm event. So you can't just go down to these outfalls at any time during any day and collect a sample. We really need to wait for a period to allow for these pollutants and contaminants to build up on the impervious surfaces and then have a significant rainfall that will then flush those pollutants out the stormwater system and out into the harbor. And that's really what we want to capture to get a better understanding of what the stormwater system is facilitating for inputs. So coordinating our schedules with the DPW schedules and the weather is a little bit challenging, but we're working on it. Unfortunately, a lot of these outfalls are also pretty inaccessible, we have found, which we weren't anticipating because a lot of them are partially or fully submerged and inundated during a mid to high tide. Uh, and some of them are even inundated on low tides. So we are needing to access them with the help of the DPW through, through manholes that are actually upgrading of the outfalls. So we really are relying on them and they've been very cooperative so far. Um, and we look forward to continuing this with them in the future. So what are we testing for? We're starting with a pretty broad spectrum of potential pollutants and contaminants. And as we continue with the study and start to get some results back, we may refine this a little bit more based on what we're finding in various locations. Um, but we're definitely trying to take a look at everything that we could possibly expect to, to see. So what can, be, what can be done to reduce some of this pollution? There's a lot of technology out there, both structural and non-structural, as far as best management practices go for stormwater. And oftentimes with these structural units that are designed to intercept the stormwater, they can be pretty cost prohibitive. Uh, they're also somewhat site specific. And in some cases, using some of the non-structural alternatives, if, you, if the space allows and the site allows, can be just as beneficial, if not more beneficial. In this uh, photo here, you can see there's a combination of structural and non-structural. So this bioremediation area, this bioretention, is essentially just allowing space for natural vegetation and soils to take up that stormwater, designing an area so that stormwater will flow into it or be pumped into it, and then 
that can be held and absorbed, and a lot of those nutrients or pollutants can be taken up either by the plants um, before it actually flows out into the harbor. And again, the town parking lot is uh, a really great spot for us to be sampling right now because the town is looking at doing some improvements to that parking lot and is interested in improving the stormwater infrastructure there at the same time. This photo was taken just a couple weeks ago. We got about an inch of rain on a Friday morning or afternoon, and you can see all of the silt and sediment that just washes out of the outfall there by the town pier every time we have a big rainfall, and that's really just from that parking lot and about two storm drains in Washington Street itself. So the parking lot has a little pocket park there you might be familiar with, and whenever it rains, it fills up with water. It's a bit of a wetland as it is, and it's really a perfect place to attempt to create a rain garden or one of these bioretention areas to help to treat the stormwater before it enters the harbor. So that's something that, with some of the information we get from our sampling program, we're hoping to, to work with the town on moving forward. And I think there's probably a minute or two for questions. Questions? Well, that's a good question. I suppose at first we need to figure out how much of those may be entering the harbor. Um, Can you the question? Oh, sure, I'm sorry. So the question was whether synthetic pollutants such as oil and petroleum products could be having a significant impact on the health of the eelgrass, for example, or the ecosystem as a whole. I mean, we all know that those products are detrimental to aquatic ecosystems for a variety of reasons, but I think getting a better handle on how much might be getting out there would be step one, um, for sure. Yeah, so there are some um, storm scepter units or other units that are designed to separate oil and grease, that sort of thing, petroleum products. and. Some of those have been installed in a couple of areas, so that those are some of the improvements that they have been working on and checking off. Um, and then obviously there's still a lot more to do. But yes, they have begun implementing as part of their improvement program and they've installed some of those units around. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Sam. Um, also, uh, just a note towards the DEP, uh, DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. I mean DPW, so many acronyms. Um, Bob McNeil is our new DPW director, um, way in the back talking with, I believe, one of our selectmen. I don't know if he sees us. Um, it's a, been a pleasure to work for him, um, work with him so far. Um, I think uh, we're very encouraged and excited uh, in the direction the DPW is heading in terms of some of these issues. and. Um, um, I, I think uh, we are excited with some of the stormwater pro pro um, projects in relation to Steve's question. Those items and infrastructure is very important, but what's also very important is the operation and maintenance of those and having a, 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 a system in place where they can be maintained appropriately, and that's why we're encouraged with, um, with Bob coming on board. Okay, finally, um, ninth inning, a relief pitcher is coming in to close it up. Um, he is the head of the Department of Natural Resources, uh, Mr. Jeff Carlson. He graduated from Auburn. Purdue. Oh, you're Auburn, sorry. Purdue University with the Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources. To wrap it up and to talk about um, some of the other outlying issues, but by no less um, not as important as it relates to boat use and moorings and some other issues. So why don't you please welcome Jeff. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'll try to be brief. I know we all want to get to oysters, especially me. Um, it's been a long time since lunch. I'm getting hungry. But before I start on my presentation, uh, I wanted to say thank you to all of you for coming. Um, this is definitely, I go to a lot of meetings and a lot of meetings about varying topics and water quality. This is really the first meeting I've been to where we have members of our board of selectmen, 
I think almost all the our Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board is here. I know I saw most of them. There's members of the Conservation Commission, a number of the guys from the Fertilizer Advisory Committee, um, and a lot of those private citizens that put in a lot of time to come to these and give their time and efforts. Um, and most of all, a big thank you to the Land Council for having arguably the most well-attended um, water quality meeting that we've had on Nantucket since I've been here. Um, I know our kind of our yearly update that we gave um, with SMAST and those folks, I think we had about four people there that weren't town staff or from the land council. Um, so this attendance is unbelievable um, and I'm glad to be here to get to talk a little bit. Um, but with that, I'd also say for those that are here and I also skipped some of the members of the Board of Health that are here because I see them too. Um, those of you who don't participate, and before I talk, because mine's more of an action based, um, I would challenge everyone here to participate. You know, step up, come to Board of Selectmen meetings, come to SHAB, come to the CONCOM, voice your concerns. If those people and the people that are making the decisions on management activities don't hear from people like you, they don't know what efforts we need to really be focusing and what people want the town to do. So come forward, we're here to help. We're all in it together. Um, the thing I think that's unique about all of the things we've talked about today, no one of these things by themselves solves our problem. There's no silver bullet that ends this. There's no, we raise the jetties, our problems are solved, hooray, water quality is fixed. We all have to do our parts to manage our wastewater, to manage our storm water, and to avoid our little impacts that we're having. So that's what I'm talking about. When Cormac asked me to, to speak today, he asked me to kind of pick up some loose ends that are there. Um, I get a lot of chance to talk about the other things and they like to make fun of me because once I get going, I have a really bad tendency to keep going and going and going. So I'll try to be short. And this one's really directed more towards boats. So just before I get started, how many people in this room own and operate a boat or go out with a friend regularly that owns and operates a boat? I know we're at the Yacht Club, so there's probably a fair, so there's a pretty fair amount of hands that, that people that do, um, and even more so, Anyone that lives here, unless you fly off every time, you have to take a boat. So boating is something that's very integral to what we're doing here. But there's a responsible way to do it, and there's the right things that we need to be doing. And it's things that we are just starting to really address as a town. We've been so focused on wastewater and stormwater, but these are some of the little day-to-day -day things that hopefully we can improve upon in a really short term to help minimize some of our direct impacts to eelgrass and to the habitat of the harbor. So, your first step, know your water body. I know hopefully everyone in here that operates a boat has seen this. This is the basic kind of nautical chart for Nantucket. It shows really important information, get to know it. It shows where you can anchor, where you can moor, depths, the other bathymetry that's there. Um, sometimes there are areas of uh, ecological concern that are marked on those, where buoys and channels are. It's important to know where you are and where you're boating. The second part to that is know your boat. Know how big it is, how much it draws, what kind of power it's there, is it appropriately sized? And kind of then aside to that, if you operate a boat, what facilities you have on board? Do you have a black water tank? Do you have a black water and gray water tank? Do you not have a gray water tank? What's on your boat? What's on the boat that you're using? Why is this important? And as an aside, I'll just bring this up briefly because we have whales in the area. Who in the audience here looks at this picture and thinks that a, a, a dolphin or whale scarred by propellers is a really big problem and something that we should avoid. Just raise a hand who thinks it's troubling. All right, so that was pretty unanimous through the group. What's interesting about that picture is when we look at Hussey Shoal from just the last year, you can see all these little, little straight lines and scars and pulls. A lot of those marks are made by propellers. A lot of them are made by dragging anchors. Those same things that we are disappointed with when we look at that dolphin are the same things that can impact our bottom. And when we have a plant that's already stressed like eelgrass from nutrient impairment, we can really cause harm. I don't think it's a Cormac slide at the end of his presentation with rooted eelgrass uprooted. It's something that we all need to be concerned with. It's something we all need to pay attention to, knowing where you're driving, knowing where you're anchoring, knowing what boat you're operating. This is easily avoided as best possible. Sometimes it can't be, totally get it, but really we can do a better job collectively at avoiding that from happening. So you need to know where you can go. You know, that helps prevent your proper anchor from dragging, knowing the propeller's not there, 
sizing your anchor and lines correct for your boat. Uh, for a lot of people, it's pretty straightforward. A lot of people don't know. Ask your mooring handlers. When you go down to Brant Point Marine, ask Rick, ask Bill. When you go down to the Harbor Master's office, ask Sheila. They'll all help you get the right materials you need to operate your boat in the harbor. And if you don't know, slow down. Slow down, observe. Put someone out to look around and see what you're doing. It's really an easy way to avoid a lot of problems and frankly, a lot of expensive damage to your boat. If you've ever paid to replace a propeller, they're not cheap. So when you look at mooring vessels, this is one of our impacts that we're really just starting to talk about in the town. Um, the Harbor Master and I have been talking a little bit over the last year about other solutions or other possibilities to try for mooring. Uh, so when we look at kind of a traditional mooring system that we use here, we typically use uh, kind of the standard Nantucket mooring. It used to be a concrete block, but now we've switched to more mushroom anchors and chains. But as you can see in this picture here, those chains sit on the bottom for a certain distance. And what you get over time is when you look at this picture, you get these little rings kind of centered around where the mooring is anchored, where you're disrupting the eelgrass, hopefully not disrupting the rooting mass, but if you are, you're tearing it out by the roots and causing a long-term impact. Those are areas that eelgrass rebounding is very possible as it's still surrounded by other healthy eelgrass, that if we can find solutions and work together to find solutions, uh, whether it's through the use of different mooring types, eco roads, which float instead of sit like traditional chain uh, or try things out. Uh, we can hopefully find some solutions to that. That's something that we're kind of in the development phase. Uh, I would encourage anyone that has experience with a more eco-friendly mooring. I would love to talk to you and get your experiences about that. Uh, you can come down and see me or email me. Uh, I know a lot of communities have tried them out. Uh, it's something that I think we would look to get more into in the very near future. because That's a really easy impact for us to help start addressing. This is kind of a big one that's also new, and it's been kind of popular and in the papers lately, pumping out your vessel. Nantucket is a federal no discharge zone, um, and there's also Board of Health regulations that address the discharge of black and gray water within Nantucket Harbor. Um, understanding that most boats that have a head have a black water tank at a very minimum, um, but there are a lot of boats that don't separate gray water off, and gray water is kind of a direct discharge. We'll talk about that in a second, but if you do have a black water tank, it's important to get your boat pumped out and pumped out correctly. The town operates a free pump out boat. It's a call, you schedule it up, you can get them right on channel 14. They'll set up a time, they'll come out and do it. The boat basin, the town pier, uh, if you're on Matic at Matic at Marine, all operate those facilities. If you tie up there or you use that facility, ask them about pump outs. Make sure you do. If you need a pump out, ask them. They're all willing to at least point you in the right direction of that resource or we'll get you there. Um, we don't want black water to get into the harbor. If you see black water in the harbor, please let someone know and we can address that as quickly as possible. Um, if you see this sign and even in other communities, that's a typical pump out sign um, and hopefully they'll get you directed to the right spot as well. The other thing that we see a lot in these direct impacts in our boat basin, town pier, mooring field uh, is washing your boats. Uh, washing your boats with soap um, can cause surfactants to get in the water and other nutrients or other gray water from your boat. When you pick a product, do it very carefully, go with it, go to the store and ask if it's a, a, a friendly product, if it's very quick to biodegrade. We encourage people to wash their boats on land as much as possible in areas that aren't discharging to the harbor. If you have to wash on the water, we encourage people to start with just good old elbow grease and kind of scrubbing down and using water only first and only using soap as kind of a method of last resort to get something as much as possible, understanding how people want to keep it clean. Uh, we also say, please don't use chemicals to clean your boat in the water. So if you want to try to clean your bottom, do bottom paint cleaning, please just, again, good old fashioned elbow grease and try not to use chemicals because those chemicals are directly being released into the harbor and potentially doing damage to our habitat. So this is kind of my wrap up. I told everyone I try to keep it brief for everyone today. Um, if you see something, please report it. Report it to the Harbor Master, report it to our office. If you don't know who to call, if you call the regular police dispatch line, they can find whoever needs to know really quickly. Um, and if you see something, please, please report it because a clean harbor is everyone's responsibility. And we ask a lot of you to 
talk to your landscaper and ask questions to them. And talk to your septic pumper and septic installers and ask questions to them. Um, these are really easy steps to do. And I think my take home message for the day is we're here to help, whether it's the land council or the town. Please participate. Please ask questions. Um, and hopefully next year, when we say everybody, we can talk about better news. And Cormac isn't as doom and gloomy as he always is. And we'll kind of move forward. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I know we also want to have questions for the panel as a whole. So if we want to start on that, we can as well. Um, Just two questions for you to start. Do you have uh, any sentiments or feelings about environmentally friendly uh, bottom tables? So there are a lot of different products that are on the market so now. Is, oh, questions. sorry. The, the question was if there are, if I had any sentiments on environmentally friendly bottom paints. Um, I'll be fair in saying there are a lot of new technologies that I know that have come out in the last three or four years, uh, especially that are more friendly. Um, I'm not familiar with all of them. Um, some of them I know are very cost prohibitive and very expensive. Um, again, that's something that I would say the better person to ask is, you know, ask the boat yard that you use or people that service your boats what's available and just ask them for the specifications on that boat paint and what's there. They'll be able to, to help you better. Rick, do you know any um, uh, environmentally good uh, bottom paints at all? Um, it's very uh, uh, water-based stuff, uh, hydro coat and stuff like that. It's, it's uh, not water-based stuff, water-based stuff. Right. Um, what about environmentally safe, mild abrasives to defoul the bottom? You, know, so you say don't use soap, but is there, are there things that can be used safely? Sand comes to mind as one, obviously. Certainly. The, the question was if there were mildly, um, if there are environmentally friendly, mild abrasives to those. And there are a number of those products that are on the market to use. Um, I know some people just use, like you said, I've known people that have used sand type products. Um, Caitlin had one that she was just mentioning. Um, they have a couple of 3M products um, that are just kind of so Caitlin was just saying that there are a couple of products that are made by the 3M Corporation that are scrubbies that do those things. Um, again, there are a number of, of options that are there. Um, I've seen other people that use bottom paints or, or bottom coatings that just require kind of a towel off that, that clean off that are, that are coming out and more available. Um, but those are, again, all options that are available from your local, local marina or, or ship chandler. Lucy? Sure, so the question that Lucy asked was if we could set up some sort of sign-up sheet uh, for people that may be interested in converting to a different style of mooring going forward. And I would say yes, I think we'd be happy to set that up either through our office or through the Harbor Master's office. Uh, part of that program we've talked about is every year when you get your mooring renewal form is including this year uh, kind of a checkbox that would indicate that you're interested in trying to switch mooring types. Because um, I think that's a program we'd like to develop, at least a pilot, to try out a couple different kinds of eco-friendly moorings. Um, I know the last one we talked about was more traditional mushroom and door moor anchor with an eco road. Um, and then also, I know we've tried some helixes with eco roads before to try out a little variety of system to help with controlling costs for people to make that switch. I'm going to jump in real quick for Toby. Also. Um Jason is walking, he walked out, right? Jason Bridges, our new selectman, Rita Higgins, our new selectman. They have the ability to also engage and initiate discussion about the transfer of conventional moorings to more eco-friendly moorings. They're our selectmen. I really encourage you to reach out to our elected officials. The more people that speak out, that critical mass happens, the more things happen. The mooring issue, it's been going on since about 2008, 2009. There hasn't been as much traction as I really um, think there should be, and I think where it really starts is the public demanding the appropriate product get put in place into the harbor. Thanks. Toby? I just wanted to follow up on that, Jeff, and I was wondering if there's been any sort of change in policy. I know that recently the town banned Felix Mornings through its regulation. That you see any change in policy moving forward in regards to the harbor map? Sure, so I think Toby's question was specifically to uh, the regulations that were passed that 
limited the use of helical moorings within Nantucket Harbor. Um, and I think the easy answer for that is exactly what Cormac said. I, I think that there are issues with helix moorings. There are with any type of mooring system, and I think everyone understands that. I think what we're really looking to get at as far as mooring systems is minimizing the amount of scour and chain sweep that we can have. And any system that does that, I think the town, and I, know I won't speak for Sheila directly, would be happy to engage in the discussion about those mooring systems. But again, I think Cormac hit the nail on the head when he said, the change and the push for that comes from the people in this room and the community to say, we see there's an impact, we want to make that change, um, and makes it happen. I mean, that's a, a regulation that's set by the Board of Selectmen. Go, you know, I, I know Jason just walked past, you know, talk to Rita, talk to Matt, talk to Jason, um, talk to Jim, talk to Dawn, say you want to see that change happen, and I would be the first to say if the selectmen all come forth and say we want to look at this and really investigate that and you know have shab look into it and other groups that that change will come any other questions for jeff or anybody on the panel dave So Dave's question um, was whether I thought it would be realistic for the town to require any boat that comes into the harbor to be pumped out whether they wanted to or not. Um, I think the easy answer to that is I, I know we have the facilities for, for pump outs at the end of the pier. Um, the boat basin has a pretty extensive network of facilities. So I think with a little bit of upgrade, the facilities are definitely in place. Um, and then it really just would become an issue of enforcement for that regulation to be in place and keeping track of that. I think that's something that the town would have to work pretty extensively with the mooring handlers and the guys that handle rent and moorings for boats that are coming in and out. Um, we tend to have a very transient community of boats. Um, I mean, obviously the ones that are, you know, wind on the slip lottery in there are pretty easy. They're kind of captive or the ones that are there for the whole summer in the boat basin. Um, the trickier ones would be the folks that are here for two days or three days or even a day um, to make sure that's happened. But I think that's a, a really valid thought and a very, you know, a very good idea. Another suggestion that's kind of come in that same vein is requiring any boat that enters Nantucket Harbor um, to have to enter uh, to put like a dye tablet in their tank. That's something that the mooring handler would issue them when they go to moor up. Um, so if they did discharge, they get the big green ring around their boat harbor master can come out or the police or whoever's in charge of that can go out and write tickets. Um, I think that's a certainly an option that may be more viable for that transient network of boats as opposed to the folks that are here for a week or longer. So I think there's kind of a meeting in the middle. Mr. Uh, the question was, could, could, can, you, can we quantify how much um, traction we've got on the regulations, on the fertilizer regulations? It's fairly difficult to actually get some hard numbers and quantify it. We certainly can't do that necessarily through water quality data because, as we presented today, so many different factors affect the water quality. However, um, speaking um, with my other colleagues on the Fertilizer Advisory Committee, many of them mentioned that um, unsolicited their clients have been asking about the BMP. Um, and asking about uh, appropriate fertilizer use. I can't quantify how many people have actually done that, but it's a start and I'm encouraged by that. And I, I do believe that there is at least more of a, of a presence and an awareness and a realization that these uh, regulations are in effect and also the deleterious uh, nature of some of the fertilizer use and some of the um, inappropriate application. Without really a, a fully funded scientific study of a lawn with a down gradient um, well, and we're very confident of any other um, alternative in inputs are not affecting that area, it's very difficult. Um, so to do that is a, is a, little, is a little difficult. Um, 
I think what we're really going to see is, is what Jeff sort of alluded to. It's part and parcel of the entire thing. And if we see over time a trend, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next year. Hopefully it'll happen three to five years, a downward trend in, um, of um, the bad levels and improving water quality. I'm going to hop. I'm going to add to that really quickly because um, I know it's important to say this is one of the reasons why talking to your landscaper and getting soil tests is so critical and doing it on a regular basis and discussing those results because while the water and measuring the water is such a combination of multiple things and involves those, work with your landscaper to review the soil test to see how they can tailor that program over time to better manage what they're putting down. I mean, I think really at the end of the day, if your guy, if your landscaper is doing that test and tailoring the program to your lawn, over time you might be able to see, you know, a reduction or a change in strategies or what's there, and you really know what's in the ground and what has the potential of leaching over time. That's why for fertilizers especially, soil testing is so critical because it's easy to do, and I will tell you now, you can get a soil test it, some of the more expensive ones can get up there, but your basic one is 20 to 25 bucks. It's really cheap to do, um, and they take about having collected dirt form. You can really get everything you need to do in about 15 minutes and send it in for 25 bucks. It's a critical piece. Sure, so that's something that we can definitely improve. Oh, so Lucy asked about Leslie. if, did I say Lucy? So Lucy, Leslie, there's too many in the room. So um, Leslie asked about collecting a soil sample or sending that in on her own. Um, that's something we can definitely make more available on the town website. I do know it, it is up there. It's just one of those pieces you have to mine out a little bit. Um, but if you ever have any questions about that or how to do it, um, please come see us down at the Natural Resources Office or at the Board of Health or even at the Land Council if you don't feel comfortable coming to the town. Um, there's a lot of really great, any place that you go, UMass or UConn are really our two closest university ones. The instructions that they give on their form and stuff that's there, they're really easy to do and they're really simple to follow. Um, if you really get stuck, I will even offer that you can probably find someone to come help you um, to go over it the first time. Or call a professional landscaper. Steve just volunteered himself, so feel free to call him. Um, any other questions? No. Uh, one final one. I should know this format, but what's the what's like the loading once nitrogen goes into the groundwater? What's the life cycle between the point at which it enters and it enters the reenters the harbor? That's not a last question. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> The question was really what is the um, ultimate cycle in terms of what nitrogen goes in, how nitrogen goes into the ground and how long it goes through. Uh, Caitlin explained that a little bit. She can, uh, in, her, in her presentation, she can touch upon it real, real briefly, if you'd like. So that's a really good question, and it's definitely um, talked about in in the Massachusetts Estuaries Project reports, which are very, very long documents that look at the geology, biology, and chemistry of um, our uh, harbor watershed and, and the, the harbor itself. But it's a really complicated question because it really depends on where you're talking about, how close it is to the harbor, what is the soil type, um, what is the rainfall for that year. So it's a really complicated question, actually. Um, but it is addressed in that, in that report, and all of the reports are available online. Anything else before we wrap up? Yes, one more. Um, I'm just wondering how much of this information is accessible to people who don't speak English? Uh, great point. Um, I meant to mention that. Um, the question was, how accessible is some of this information for um, uh, individuals who don't speak English as their primary language? What we've done with the BMP, uh, the best management practices, that is in Spanish um, and available to people. In, some, in our first commercial that we put on AC 97.7, um, it was a 30 second uh, piece about the BMPs and the regulations. 15 seconds was in English, 15 seconds was translated into Spanish by Roberto, too. 
<laughs> um, that is a critical component, whether it be Hispanic speaking, Eastern European speaking, Brazilian, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Portuguese speaking. That is something that we really need to be cognizant of, not just this year, but really with the dem changing demographics of, of Nantucket, we have to do a lot better job on that. So that's a good point. Um, okay, so we're going to wrap up, and I just want to have, uh, there was one friendly announcement by Great Harbor. Um, if you are parked in a members-only spot, please, if you could find another spot for your car, that'd be much appreciated. And then um, two points that I want to go forward. As uh, Tara said, we are having our annual meeting on August <laughs> 8th at Bartlett's Farm um, in the afternoon at, I'm sorry, 5 o'clock. I should know this. And uh, Leah is doing a presentation about um, the oyster reef um, that she has um, done in um, Shimo Creek. We also have a nice video um, that Morgan Wraith um, put on um, and is still working on, but I've seen a, the first cut and it's actually really, really good. So that's going to be displayed. And then um, also another thing that we tried out last week, which I really encourage you to get on. We've been um, partnering with Simon Edwards, um, who owns and operates a uh, oyster farm up in the Head of Harbor. And we partnered with him and Shearwater Excursions to do a tour um, up to the, uh, the oyster farm. And we do a presentation on the harbor, nutrients, really condensed version of what we've done today. And Simon um, talks about the oyster farm. It's really, I've never been up there by boat, and it was a great experience. Our next one is June, July 26. And we can also, um, because it's so successful, I think we could, if there's enough generated interest, we can keep doing multiple and additional ones. It's a great tour, a great, great thing to get out. And then finally, we've reached the end. Um, please join us for some of Simon's fabulous oysters. Have a drink. Continue the conversation. That's what we're asking about. Get in touch with myself or any one of my colleagues who are presented or anybody else in the nonprofit community, Mariah Mitchell, Conservation Foundation, everyone, Mass Audubon. Let them know what you're thinking, particularly as it relates to our topic today and how we can do better as a town nonprofit community, but also collaborate with you, the citizens of Nantucket. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Enjoy the rest of your night. Following up on a thought that somebody mentioned yep. from back there. Uh,